the International Space Station. Just 400 kilometers above Earth, this is man's outpost to space. If we ever want to get beyond the moon, it is this man-made structure that will be our first step. 16 nations from around the world have come together to build the elements needed to complete this cosmic outpost. One of the most important parts of Space Station historically is the fact that this was the world combined leaving Earth for the very first time, permanently. You're in a real international part of the International mm -hmm. Space Station, an American uh, robotic workstation inside a European Cooper operating a Canadian arm, and one of the things the arm is going to do is grapple the Japanese transfer vehicle mm -hmm. that uh, would also be supplying logistics to the station. At an estimated cost of $60 billion and behind schedule, teams are working around the clock to get essential station components ready to go into space. The vehicle used to transport almost all of the pieces from Earth is NASA's space shuttle. It alone holds the key to what will truly be the biggest man-made structure in space. Weighing in at more than 180,000 kilograms, the International Space Station orbits the Earth every 92 minutes. As it travels over us at a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour, scientists and engineers from four continents are busy building the parts for this unique research center. These include the Columbus Laboratory under construction in Germany, the Node 3 and Coppola observation deck built in Italy, and the Japanese experiment module now stored at the Kennedy Space Center. Also in Florida, waiting to leave Earth, is an extension to the spine of the space station called the Truss. The only means to transport this heavy equipment to the space station is the shuttle. So if the station is to grow, it's essential the shuttle runs as often as possible. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I mean, our long wait may be over. Uh, so on behalf of the many millions of people who believe so deeply in what we do, good luck out to you and have a little fun up there. Well, thanks to you, to the launch team, and to everybody in the shuttle program, the crew is go for launch. Go Ten seconds, go for main start. engine start. Seven, six, five, three engines up and burning. Three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, beginning America's new journey to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Commander Alan Collins confirming Discovery is rolling onto a course for rendezvous with the International Space Station. Standing by now for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Discovery jettisons external fuel tank. The shuttle's destination is the International Space Station. From the uh, launch team down here, we have a lot of smiling, happy faces now that the United States is back in the crew launch business. The task of supplying the hardware and know-how to build the International Space Station is assigned to a global network of spaceflight experts and scientists. Some of them have devoted their entire careers to making the International Space Station a reality. The combined manpower that has gone into building, launching, and in-space assembly of the space station to date represents the biggest construction project in history. But it has all come down to this. Can they get the hardware and equipment still needed to complete the station into space, and at what cost? Sometimes the cost is more than money and man hours. On February 1st, 2003, the shuttle program suffered a catastrophic setback. Yep, we're getting some G, so let's let go of the car and it falls. This is amazing, it's really getting uh, really bright out there. In Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages and we did not copy your last. Roger, uh, Communications uh, with Columbia were lost at about 8 a.m. Central Time, about the 10, 10 minutes ago. Flight Director Leroy Kane is now instructing controllers to uh, get out their contingency procedures and uh, begin to follow those. Following this tragedy, the shuttle fleet was grounded indefinitely, leaving the fate of the International Space Station hanging in the balance. To try and, and fly the shuttle again after a crash, after we've killed people, takes a lot of, a lot of people working together, but it really takes a, a lot of courage to do it as well. In 2005, after a seemingly textbook launch of Space Shuttle Discovery, Mission Control were faced with a frightening reality. 
foam insulation had disengaged from an external fuel tank during liftoff. Despite two and a half years of careful planning since Columbia, no one knew why this had happened again. NASA needed to know if any damage had been caused before the shuttle and its crew could return to Earth safely. July 2005. Earth waits as NASA prepares to inspect Space Shuttle Discovery for damage. The very future of the International Space Station hangs in the balance. Billions of dollars worth of space hardware sits on Earth waiting for a ride into space. Florida, they end up landing in uh, California. Ian Christie and his team at NEPTEC developed the laser scanning technology used to search for damage on Space Shuttle Discovery. The team have just returned from Houston, where they process the critical in-orbit scans of the shuttle. This is the first uh, of about a 90-minute procedure sweeping back and forth using the laser dynamic range imager, uh, which is an infrared uh, camera, uh, ensuring that uh, the nose incurred no damage during Discovery's eight and a half minute climb to orbit yesterday. But I'm bet there's a bunch of flight directors and people in the MMT who are quite happy to have 3D data and will wonder where it is next flight if they don't have it. The yeah. nose cap uh, piece of damage actually did have some laser camera data. So yes. of all the things that they were concerned about, that one was presented there. And that's without having, having thought a lot about how to get the data. I mean, next flight, lessons learned, we'll, we'll be expecting to do contingency stuff, right? Yeah, it seems like whenever they want to look at tile, uh, they look at LCS. The laser camera is attached to a shuttle arm, which maneuvers it around the craft. The scans were a success, and damage to the shuttle was located. A piece of filler from between the thermal protection panels that protect the shuttle from extreme heat on re-entry had become dislodged at launch. funny for me because I've been working with Ian Christie for over 10 years. He supported me on my first flight and to see those, those early thoughts of the lasers and the cameras that we need, to see them evolve and grow into something that made it possible to fly Discovery, those guys should really take a lot of pride in, in the creativity and the inventions they came up with. Chris Hadfield knows all about the operation of mechanical arms. As chief of robotics for NASA astronauts, he's responsible for the shuttle arm's bigger brother, Canadarm2. Permanently fixed to the space station, Canadarm2 weighs in at 1,800 kilos, is 17 and a half meters long, and is capable of moving a mass of over 100,000 kilos. When the major structural components of the station make it into space, it's Canadarm2's job to lever them into position. A job which requires detailed preparation and rehearsal on the ground which Chris undertakes with Canadian Space Agency robotics instructor, Jamie Savigny. So once you've grappled it yep. and the, state, the shuttle arm has released it, sure. we're going to perform a roll, okay. like such, and then we're going to move it up, okay. and we're going to, actually I should say you are going to <laughs> yeah. connect it to the, uh, the station. Okay, so I will still be on, uh, on grapple fixture number three here, yep. and the other end will be down on the arm, so it's a pretty good reach for Canada Arm to get this thing there, huh? Yeah, it's, a, it's at its limits. Do we have uh, spacewalking astronauts out there giving us uh, any sort of uh, guidance? Time. Okay, no. so it's purely done on the robotic views, okay. I don't think people realize that even though they're up in microgravity, things still have a mass, and in order to get something moving, you still have to exert such a force, and at the same time, in order to stop it, uh, you still require a great amount of force, and humans just couldn't do that. Yeah, moving something around that, that has a mass of 20,000 kilograms and trying to move around, it's like, like pushing a sailboat sitting next to the dock. Even though it's hugely massive, you can get it started, but if it gets going fast, it can still crush your leg against, against the, the dock. As Space Shuttle Discovery awaits repairs, on Earth, work continues to get the major space station components completed and ready for departure. The man coordinating the various projects in Europe is Alan Thurkettle. From his home in Holland, he is coordinating work on the Columbus module in Germany, the Node 3 in Italy, and the Coppola observation deck now at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In the Netherlands, he's also at the helm of the design and development of the ATV, 
the European Space Agency's automated transfer vehicle. The ATV is an unmanned craft that will ultimately be responsible for supplying the International Space Station and the astronauts who live there with all they need to survive. This is the automated transfer vehicle mm -hmm. that will uh, be coming up there to uh, load best part of 20 tons of supplies for you. It, uh, it's the most complicated spacecraft we've ever built in, uh, in Europe. With, uh, a million lines of code on the thing, uh, all sorts of subsystems combining a human spacecraft with, uh, with all the, the satellites as well. It's a very, very complicated uh, vehicle. Complicated it may be, but across the Atlantic at the Kennedy Space Center, they have a complication of their own. Space, they've run out of it. Until we start flying more hardware and getting it out of the building, mm -hmm. floor space is going to be a real premium. And then once we have a manifest and we know when the trusses will start flying and the building will start emptying out, then mm -hmm. we can make a better plan for how we're going to yeah. accommodate the, yeah. the pressurized section and the other okay. external facilities. Billions of dollars of space station hardware sits and waits for the decision on the shuttle. It's on the floor of the high bay at Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. The Alenia facility in Turin, Italy. And here at the Space Transportation Division of EADS in Bremen, Germany. Columbus module is a 10 payload, four and a half meter long laboratory where, when completed, astronauts will be able to conduct thousands of experiments in the weightlessness of space. But there's a major problem. The wires sent in from the United States are not compatible with the connectors here in Germany, causing an extended delay. To try and meet their deadlines, the team must press on. Node 3 designed to carry the life support systems for the International Space Station. Node 3 will also provide valuable additional docking ports for the new structures, crucial for the growth of the International Space Station. But like the Columbus module, it will go nowhere until the work here is complete. So what about the planning today, Daniel? Well, uh, we basically have two activities. The first is uh, to check uh, the problem that we have found yesterday. That, uh, was, on the radar uh, beam? Yeah, on the radar beam. And uh, then uh, we will go ahead with the installation of the EMV valve. So that means that the overnight shift completed the RMS installation? Yes, yeah, so they have found no problem for all this night. So. And still today we are proceeding with further two shift, first yes, and second again, shift? Yes, uh, second shift, again the harness, and the third shift also again harness. Hopefully if we solve this uh, issue on the radial beam, uh, we are back on track, which is very Correct. good. In Italy, the Node 3 team are back on track. But in Germany, the Columbus module team are feeling the pressure. Head of Systems Engineering, Rudiger Kledzig, and Project Manager, Gunther Brandt, are behind schedule. Bernardo Patti, Columbus Mission Manager, wants some answers. We just realized that we have taken nine weeks of delay for Columbus reintegration, and we have taken two more weeks of delay for payload integration. So that makes 11 cool weeks. And, uh, okay, if there is a lesson learned, fine, we should not get any more delay. If we don't learn the lesson, which is to control those open works, then we are going to expand this delay. And uh, I understand the shuttle is grounded, I understand a lot of things, but I don't care at all. You know what uh, we want, uh, which is our, our policy. Yeah, Just Bernardo, uh, I, I agree what you're saying. Yeah, and, uh, all the time, but... Uh, no, no, uh, at the moment, at the moment, uh, Bokat Schmitz and Paolo Artuzzi are sitting with a list and uh, the current schedule and uh, see how they can put those activities into the schedule.
When the shuttles resume regular flights, one of the first pieces of hardware destined for the space station will be a part of a 300-foot integrated truss structure. The backbone of the space station, it will support a one-acre span of solar panels, providing the inhabitants with up to 110 kilowatts of power, enough to power 55 households. The external stowage platform is filled with hardware that will be installed on the station on future shuttle assembly missions when large truss structure components are delivered to the station to expand the station's electrical capability and to set the stage for the addition of other international modules such as the Europeans Columbus Science Laboratory and the Japanese Kibo module. Boeing managers David Bethay and Charles Hardison oversee the final assembly work on components at the processing facility at Kennedy Space Center. In line 42, hoisting the S5 truss to install UTAS bearings Ready today. This morning. Led by lift manager Jim Daniel, the team will use a 12-ton crane to lift the almost two-ton truss into position to insert the new bearing. It's a delicate task that requires precision, care, and a lot of manpower. This is an important modification that will allow for more experiment attach points on the truss. This payload's about 4,000 pounds. We're going to ground the seal it to the hook, but we're not going to do any metrology. The objective is just to lift this payload about uh, 12 inches. We'll install the UTAS bearings. They go on the south side of the payload. We will do a trunnion inspection. We'll clean the trunnions, set it back down, torque the caps, and uh, restow the sealant. All right, let's have a safe lift. John, up increase to two. John, up slow to four. As crews on Earth work up to three shifts a day to get equipment ready for transport, in space, fixing shuttle discovery is of the utmost importance. Uh, Houston, uh, it, do you want us to press on or we could wrap this up now? It's your call. But working and living in space comes with its own set of rules. There are things that, that happen to the human body in space. It, it's like this super accelerated test bed for the body. Uh, your bones demineralize. It's as if suddenly I was 75 years old, uh, getting aged like in some Star Trek episode where suddenly my, my bones are shedding and I'm getting osteoporosis. It happens to me right away in space. And yet, we don't understand why, and when I come back, it reverses. We don't understand the mechanism, yet here's this great laboratory where people and, and any other animals we bring up with us, we can study and maybe crack the, the causes of osteoporosis and how to treat it and how to reverse it. And if you can get up to space and do those things, you can do fundamental research that is absolutely impossible to do on the surface of the Earth. But getting the laboratories into space to carry out the experiments will require NASA's shuttles. And they are being retired in 2010 by orders of the President of the United States. They will ultimately be replaced by sophisticated spacecrafts like the automated transfer vehicle. It's a very well-proven uh, docking system that the Russians have used on the Soyuz and the Progress uh, for many years. Very reliable, good, mm. robust system, and uh, we're very happy to, uh, to have it on the ATV. And here we see the, the end of the mission, actually, of the ATV returning uh, back to Earth because it, uh, it burns up completely in the atmosphere. Eh? Yes, all the trash that you've generated uh, on orbit goes into the, uh, the ATV and we, uh, we bring it back and burn it up so that uh, the station doesn't get full of, uh, full of rubbish. So uh, the next project then is to make one of these, but that doesn't burn up so you can bring me back to Earth. The longest serving manned spacecraft in the world is the Soyuz. Three, two, one. We have ignition, we have ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the Soyuz rocket beginning the first expedition to the International Space Station and setting the stage for permanent human presence in space. After the Columbia shuttle disaster of 2003, the only remaining link between Earth and the space station were the Russian Soyuz and Progress rockets. Standing by for contact. We have contact confirmed. The Soyuz function was to deliver replacement crews. It was also the emergency escape vehicle for the inhabitants of the space station and only left for Earth when another came to replace it. The Soyuz partner is the unmanned Progress cargo spacecraft. For the last two and a half years, the Progress craft has delivered all of the life-giving supplies needed by the beleaguered space station. The one thing they cannot do is deliver the nodes and modules needed to complete the space station. That can only be done by NASA's shuttle.
as international partners around the globe hurry to prepare the crucial hardware for the space station, astronauts Steve Robinson and Soichi Noguchi step out into the vastness of space to begin their own important task, assessing firsthand the damage to space shuttle discovery. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, the rooftop is already open. Somebody already out there? August 2005, and no future mission dates can be confirmed until Space Shuttle Discovery returns to Earth. Space agencies around the world can't be certain if their equipment will ever be transported into space. With the damage on the shuttle located, it's up to astronauts Steve Robinson and Soichi Noguchi to perform vital repair work. Good view of Soichi Noguchi at the end of the Canadarm2, which is being operated by Wendy Lawrence. She is maneuvering him over to the brand new control moment gyroscope near the aft bulkhead of the uh, payload bay of Discovery. While Steve Robinson and Suichi Noguchi undertake work in the cold, dark vastness of space, fellow astronauts Thomas Ryder and Dan Tanney's office is the pool at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Over 60 meters long and 12 meters deep, this pool takes over a month to fill and contains full-size replicas of space station components. It simulates as close to a spacewalk experience as is possible on Earth. It also gives the astronauts the opportunity to practice and rehearse difficult maintenance tasks on the replica immersed in over 6 million gallons of water. Uh, good morning. This morning we're going to be running the Increment 13 crew, Thomas Ryder and Dan Tanney through uh, the 12A cleanup uh, EVA-1 task, gain, giving them the familiarity for those tasks. The main focus is to have them really gain as much familiarity with the umbilicals. Um, if they get anything beyond that, that's uh, all extra gravy. May I get the, 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 with the drink valve right in the middle now? It, it tucks under the valve, so it's, it's completely out of my way, and I can still get to it. But you can tuck it back in under that valve. I wanted to bring actually my glass. Well, not not that my vision deteriorates, but my arms are getting too <laughs> <Sure>. short. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Right. Uh, Astronaut Dan Tanny trains with veteran Thomas Ryder. Thomas is scheduled to be one of the next astronauts to live and work on the space station. For every hour of walking in space, the astronauts need to do seven at the pool in Houston. KDCS, all arms have been enabled. There are no alarms to impact us. Copy, no alarms. Hey, good morning, Safety Towers. This is Greg, your test director. How do you remember this morning, EV1 Safety, EV2? Copy, I'm going to back up. And Dan and Thomas, I would just remind you again today, make sure you use the descent line to let yourselves down. Make sure you clear your ears early and often. So once you get it out 90 degrees, you can reinsert the uh, pit pin on the lockout arm. Chris, you might look up to the lab window. Hey guys, we're getting an awesome video right now. Susan's looking at, looking at you out the lab window, but we also see some reflections of all the clouds go by reflected in the lab window. You know, the big difference between this and working underwater in the training pool is, uh, is even though you're floating in the water, you're still weighed down by gravity in the, in the suit. But when you get to space, you are weightless and the suit is weightless so you are in fact floating around like a ping pong ball in a cage inside your spacewalking suit it's the weirdest feeling Alan Thurkettle has two pressing issues to deal with. Delays with the European Space Agency's Columbus Laboratory being built in Germany, and closer to home, a critical test deployment of the ATV solar array panel in the Netherlands. Jeff, you'll have to, uh, to take the lead this morning on the, uh, the solar array drive uh, test itself, because I've got a meeting with, uh, with Danielle now that uh, I'll have to attend at 10.30, so I'm not quite sure, but proceed without, uh, without me if necessary. I'll join you as soon as I can. The test being performed on the billion-dollar ATV is to make certain that the solar array panels deploy properly in space. 
There have been some serious concerns about the bracket hinge system. Experts from Germany and France have flown in to work with the Dutch team. The solar array panels will power the ATV on its journey to supply the space station. So did you hear they're going to delay the, uh, the next shuttle flight until March? March next year? Yeah. That's, that a, that's a bit of a problem for us now because with Columbus and the, uh, the nodes that have got to go up, we're getting later and later. And uh, well, the scientists are getting a little bit upset that they're not getting their, their work done properly the way they wanted to. I really hope that NASA can get the, the thing sorted out and get it up and flying again because it's, it's very, very necessary. Still, the longer it's on the ground, the more the ATV is necessary. And this is what scientists throughout the world are waiting for. The launch of sophisticated research laboratories like the Japanese Experiment Module, or GEM. It is Japan's single most advanced laboratory ever destined for space. A key design feature of the GEM is an exposed deck that weighs over 4,000 kilos. Here, it will be possible to create experiments in the vacuum of space, using a 10-meter long robotic arm controlled by the astronauts. It was named Kibo, the Japanese word for hope. The hope here is that after 10 years of development and sitting at NASA for two years, it will finally take its place in space. And if all goes well, then this too is where the Columbus module will call home. In Germany, discussions continue over the American and European size discrepancies that are causing delays to Columbus's completion. We are able to uh, crimp the American size uh, wires with our European size uh, pins. Correct. Although they all have the same AWG size. From the specification, they are the mm -hmm. same, but the tolerance are so big that we uh, have had to develop a method to, uh, to fix it into the pin. Mm -hmm. And we, we do it by inserting small, thin wires to fill the crimp up, and then we, and then we crimp. And so, that, tomorrow in our telecon, we have a proper story for ESA. Yes, I think so. I think Explain so. our delay. And I think so. And now we can also commit to, to the test that we envisage here. Yes. But on the other side, we cannot take any compromise on the quality. So, uh, we have to fix it really. And uh, I told you the other day that we make a voltage drop test over such a crimp. And if the voltage drop is not okay or is in the specification, uh, we cannot accept that. Uh, well, sure. Tomorrow, we tell ESA. Problem, problem solved. We solved it. Mm -hmm. We are sorry, we have the delay. Yeah. Due to... <laughs> due to what? <laughs> what shall we tell them? Yeah, and, uh, so we, we, we get material which is out of specification yeah, several yeah, times, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, that, uh, and that is a problem. Uh, <laughs> why can't they stick yeah. to the standards, huh? Yeah, why can't they stick to the standards? We have to, to teach the American how to do this one day. <laughs> Back in America, at the Kennedy Space Center, work is nearly finished on the insertion of the bearing into the truss. Yeah, All right, if both your uh, shackles are loose, please uh, de shackle. Lily, did you say the weight was 4,000? 4,010. 4,010. And we had, of course, you know, we put the flight wing on. The other main thing that we had going on today was the uh, lift of the S5 cargo element to put that split bearing on. We have uh, a bunch of vendors coming in next week to start the work on the on P5 and S5, and we still had that forward work on S5 to get that split bearing in. Lift should be going on. Now. Yeah, so we can check it out on the. Let's on the take monitor. a look. Let's see. <clears throat> I think it's 47. Shuttle stuff, VAB, administrator. Yeah, there we there are. There it is. Today, uh, we're just lifting it up uh, to get that split bearing on so when they install the, the device inside the trunnion, that uh, if it expands, we'll be able to get the bearing off. Hey, wrap it up. That does it. Uh, real successful job today. And then we have to move very slowly. As the International Space Station continues its 250 million kilometer a year journey in space, moving the ATV just a few meters on Earth can prove difficult. Keep the treadle in position. The ATV supply vehicle is being pushed into position for important testing. Stop! To get to this point, Almost 150 international space experts analyzed over 50,000 pages of technical documentation before the design was approved. Okay. 
fare con gli inizi. Ok, we have finished the check. Ok, thank you. Meanwhile, in Germany, Columbus project manager Gunter Brandt updates Alan Thurkettle. Good afternoon, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Gunter. Well, I uh, just uh, want to uh, give you feedback on the, on the problems uh, that we had in our harness uh, production. I think we mentioned that uh, there was this uh, stupid discrepancy between this uh, American uh, wire gorge and the uh, European pin. We did all this testing and all these goodies. Uh, so now the process is okay and uh, we proceed in crimping the harness. Uh, and yesterday we checked uh, the uh, situation and I think we can now commit to our, our test day, the 14th. Yes, I'm, I'm not that concerned with, uh, with what may or may not have caused this, uh, this slippage, Gunther. What, uh, what I'm concerned with is the slippage. And uh, uh, the whole schedule that, uh, that we're trying to, uh, to work on is to make sure that we finish all the power-up activities on the, uh, the flight hardware by the end of this year. And what I absolutely need from you is confirmation that uh, you've got workarounds that will enable that still to, uh, to occur. In Italy, another setback. Progress on the Node 3 is halted when tape securing a heater protection pad comes loose. Something as simple as this on Earth could lead to a catastrophe in orbit. If this becomes loose, could be dangerous for the people inside. Eh? Because, you know, these heaters are uh, critical for the operation of the node, especially when uh, is, uh, the node is not powered in orbit. Eh? During the transfer from uh, the shuttle to the berth into the station, this is to prevent freezing and condensation. Yeah. Next, they need to install a vital valve to stabilize the pressure between the shuttle and node 3. This valve gives the possibility to, to reach the same pressure before to open the door, internally and externally, and to have also the change of the hair itself, because we have an inlet line and an outlet line, then they can open the door and, and have the real access to the, to the shuttle. In addition to the race to complete the various nodes and modules on time, the team also faced the challenge of transporting yes, projects between international borders. Something is coming here with a big value. Is, uh, there is another work of integration uh, and is then shipped back in a different configuration. I, I understand what you're saying and I agree that, that that should work, but I'm not an import expert, expert and I don't know how many laws I will be bending or breaking. If we change something, it's not uh, really easy for us because then we, we have to go back to our government uh, organization. As it flies in the freezing temperatures of space, the International Space Station needs protection from the elements. At Kennedy Space Center, a team of sewers put together thermal blankets which cover every single part of the structure. A lot of the blankets that needed modifications um, they, they didn't want to take the blanket off again. They wanted to leave it on the station. So we had to basically go up there and literally fix the thing. That's where a lot of the hand sewing really came in handy. On a mission in 2001, Dan Tanney and Linda Gondwin wrapped insulation blankets around vulnerable solar array drive motors. Four years later, and Steve Robinson is about to undertake the single most important spacewalk in recent NASA history as he locates and attempts to remove Discovery's tile gap filler which came loose during its launch. Yeah, looking through Steve's eyes here, you, you have to shake your head while you're up there just to focus back in on what you're doing because the, the visuals absolutely fill your mind. It's just overpowering. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. Constantly like Niagara pouring into your head. And somehow you've got to clear all that and focus on fixing the space shuttle. Do they have training on how to focus on the task and not you know, focus was, on the Earth that's going by? That was the biggest surprise for me, was I had concentrated so much in the pool getting trained technically, but when I went outside, I just absolutely had to stop for a minute and just honor the world and just yeah. look at it. You could not ignore the beauty of what was happening around you. It is crucial that the person who's operating the arm has a very steady and a smooth ramp in and a ramp out. Right. Otherwise, you do induce oscillations in your robotic arm. Right, you sure don't want to be bouncing back and forth up against the belly of the yes. orbiter. Yeah, especially if you have somebody on the end of it um, who right. himself, he can, he can induce some oscillations in the arm, so it's very important that, that you have that steady, steady hand controller inputs. Like a worm on a hook. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Robinson retrieved the loose tile gap filler from the belly of the shuttle. And to everyone's relief, it was a simple procedure. The brakes are on, here I go. 
So they must be looking into what type of things could make one of these things come loose? Well, it's a big mystery as to uh, why they came loose and why they don't. I mean, there are thousands of them. How come only two of them came loose? You yeah. know, and, and when Steve reached in to grab them uh, out on the spacewalk, I mean, he could just grab it and just slide it out like pulling a letter out of an envelope. And uh, we, we don't know why they work loose. The big question was, would they have allowed us to enter the atmosphere safely or not with one of these sticking up this much yeah. out of the belly? Probably we would have been okay, but since Columbia, probably is not good enough. You know, Steve is the uh, lead guitarist in the band I play in, and so we really trusted him with uh, to have the, the finger-picking skills to, to <laughs> yank this out of there. You made it look so simple. Yeah, and it really turned out to be simple. A huge relief to everybody, because if it had been hard and he had to saw it off or something, it would have been uh, much less elegant. But he really showed that through a huge amount of work, planning on the ground, you can make something that has previously been impossible into something very straightforward. With the gap filler removed, NASA gives Space Shuttle Discovery the okay to return home. Space flight is so important, uh, getting our space station built, and you know the, the dreams and the opportunities that we have to go back to the moon and on to Mars. Um, you know what we're doing here is worth it, and we know that there's risk, but if we don't if we don't uh, try it, we're never going to be able to beat the risk. Steve Robinson successfully removed the damaged tile gap filler and Mission Control gave the shuttle the green light to start its journey back home to Earth. Mission and station, we have physical separation. The two-week, 9.3 million kilometer journey is almost over. All that NASA and their international partners had hoped for was a safe shuttle mission to get the space station program back on track. Discovery is home. With the shuttle safely home, it's now all about the future. The future of the International Space Station. So Frank, there's one other thing I wanted to, uh, to show you, and that's a, a little element called the cupola. It's mm -hmm. the only part of the station that's specifically designed for the astronauts. Oh, really good. Other areas are designed for the scientists and, uh, and to house all the clever systems and everything, but uh, the cupola is uh, specifically for the astronauts. It's your window on the world. Uh, the part of the vehicle that's designed for astronauts, exclusively for astronauts, for you to uh, be able to see Mother Earth. We will also uh, control the robotic arm from inside the cupola, yeah, I think. Yeah, the robotic workstation will, uh, will go in there. Also, the interior design, you mean, uh, will be very nice to look at. Uh... That's right, yeah. It'll be designed like a Ferrari, but at the cost of a Ford. Or <laughs> maybe like a Ford, but at the cost of a Ferrari. <laughs> My dad worked on the Apollo. Yeah. He was inspector that inspected the module and that type stuff. When we were doing the Apollo, everybody was 25 to 28 years old, crew cuts, no goatees, very studious, and it was just really different, you know? Well, been a day today, huh? Yep. That's about ah, all I can day. say. It's a typical day, but everything went well, and yeah. that's what we try to do every day. Right. <laughs> I've got some, uh, a lot of good memories and a lot of uh, great, great work out there and that's on the stage right now. And, uh, I make it an effort every time I know I can get a visual of it. When it flies overhead, I like to go outside in the morning, early in the morning, go out and watch it fly overhead, knowing that that's my work up there. <laughs> I think we did ourselves proud. I think the experience in MCC really paid off. They were actually using our stuff to learn stuff about the shuttle. It wasn't just, you know, it, it was an important contribution, and it made a difference. We take the folks who built the particular element, and we take the folks who are going to fly it, you know, put their keisters on the line, and we sit down and we drink the bottle top to bottom. You're in a real international part of the International mm. Space Station, an American uh, robotic workstation inside a European cupola operating a Canadian arm, and one of the things the arm is going to do is grapple with the Japanese transfer vehicle mm -hmm. that uh, would also be supplying logistics to the station. It's a very good uh, multicultural <laughs> environment indeed. It certainly is. And we are uh, in such early stages of exploring space, people take it for granted, but in the whole history of the American space program, they've launched 145 times total with people. You know, 145 times, you're just, you're just starting to understand something, and yet people think it's, it's very mature. And so much of what we do in space is the early stages of just trying to establish right from wrong. Oh, does this work? Well, that doesn't work. We don't do that. When you're building a spaceship, when you're building a space station, if we're going to go any further out into space, we've got to have a place to test all those things. And without a place to test them, we'd just be guessing when we leave Earth.